right then, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Allow me to welcome you most cordially uh, to this up close session that is uh, named the evolution of civic activism in America. I'd like to welcome you here in the Municipal Library of Prague. And I would like to start by asking a dear person who would uh, join us here on the stage and start uh, the session for us. Her name is Ilona Viss, and she's the founder and director of the Behal Fair Institute uh, based here in Prague who is giving the umbrella to this wonderful project. Ilona, welcome. Yours is the floor. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and as Tomas said, welcome to this first in a series of up-close events that we have been um, working on for over a year, creating this project. Um, and I wanted just to, as he mentioned, um, up-close is a project of a nonprofit that I started uh, several years ago um, in honor of my family. My family is Czech, Hungarian, and Slovak, and it's particularly in honor of my parents, who were both educators, who were forced to leave Czechoslovakia in 1938 because of the uh, coming war. They emigrated to the United States, where they worked as teachers throughout their lives. They were inspired by the values of the First Republic and developing strong social, the idea of developing strong social and political consciences, which guided them in their efforts to nurture communication and enhance mutual understanding and acceptance of all people as equal members of the global community. And that was the mission that they had personally in their professional lives for 50 years in the United States. Although they came back to visit, they never did return to live here. They became United States citizens. From then I learned the importance of communication, seeking to walk in the shoes of other people, gaining empathy in that process, building bridges of communication and understanding between people of different backgrounds, different cultures, and experiences starting from throughout history, really. So today, our goal is to begin a very important conversation. To, we chose to begin it with the United States, the activism, the history of activism, because we feel that the Black Lives Matter movement has now become a global matter, and it's something from which we can all learn how to look at events in the world, especially people and events and situations that are different than what we are familiar with. This is called, you know, walking in other people's shoes and from that having the learning about empathy. So I want to welcome you and thank you for being here today. I think we all have a lot to listen to. I'm very much looking forward to our guests. And I just want to, before I go back to them, I want to thank everyone who has supported the efforts of BFI, my organization, and also this particular project. But over the years, our friends at the US Embassy, especially have to give a shout out to Helena Vagnerova, who has brought Megan King and me together and introduced us to Tanya, who major players in this particular activities, who then it just goes on and on like that. And so without Helena and all our friends at the US Embassy, I don't feel that we would be maybe even here today. And of course, the other person I really want to thank is good friend Tomas Shahak, and that through his kindness and support, we have gotten here as well to talk and begin a conversation that Tomas and I for many years have talked about is really necessary in order for us to all come together in a, in a spirit of understanding and interest and caring. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ilona, for your introductory remarks. And why don't we continue with uh, introducing the panel? I'd like to start with the introduction of my fellow colleague, uh, moderator, who is Tonya Graves, Graves uh, the American multigenre singer, who has been a major presence on the Czech music scene for the past 26 years. Uh, she has performed with bands like Liquid Harmony, The Under Band. She spent years with Monkey Business Band, and uh, she has won several Czech Angel Awards. Tonya has acted in several films and is a regularly appealing television celebrity. She is an ambassador for Nadachni Fond Aquapura and is active with several charities. Tonya is an acclaimed artist and activist and is our moderator today. Thank you for that, Tonya. And I pass the mic on you now. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, my co-moderator today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is uh, Dr. Tomas Boschka. Uh, Tomas is the founder of the Journalist Incubator. Um, he also heads, uh, he's the head of the Czech Political Prisoners Association. He previously worked as a spokesman for the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports of the Czech Republic. Um, and he's also worked with the Aspen Institute, uh, the Prague Show Memorial, the Heinrich Bill Stiftung <laughs> uh, Association, and many others. As well, uh, he lectures at NYU Prague, um, uh, CET academic programs, and he's also an activist, and he is my co-moderator for today. Thank you for that. <laughs> And now, let me turn uh, to our first guest on the panel, who is Dr. Norma J. Harvey, who is a historian who earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota after three master degrees, one in Southern US history, one in uh, Russian history, and a master's degree in library science. She has taught at San Bonaventure University in New York, at the Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota, and Luther, Luther College in Iowa. She is the recipient of, of two Fulbright grants, the first at Charles University, which led to an invitation to serve as an Erasmus lecturer in Czechia in 2008. She has taught uh, African-American history, immigration, and post-World War II US history at Charles University. Thank you. Prior to, to uh, seeking graduate education, she and her husband lived in New York State with their six children, where Dr. Harvey became a local activist in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Good afternoon, Norma, to you, and welcome on the panel. Um, we will have another uh person on the panel with us today, uh, Kelsey Roman, will be joining us a little bit later, but uh, she is uh, basically representing the next generation of leaders and activists, and we'll speak more about Kelsey when she arrives in just a bit. Tomas? That's, that's a good idea. Thank you, Tonya. Um, the next person, the next guest on our panel is Charles Chuck Seaton, uh, who is a Chicago native who grew up in Chicago's iconic Lincoln Park. Uh, Gold Coast neighborhood. After years of working in corporate America, he left to start his own consulting and marketing company focused on branding within the urban black community. After starting a family in Chicago, he and his family decided to relocate to his wife's childhood village in East Prague to create a better future for his wife and daughters. He documents the Czech hip hop community through photography and videography. Good afternoon, Chuck. Welcome on the panel as well. Um, and our next guest uh, on the panel, virtually, uh, is a very special guest, uh, Dr. Finney D. Coleman. Uh, he's a faculty member in the Department of English Language and Literature at the University of New Mexico. Um, but he earned his PhD at the University of Virginia in America uh, and Afri in African American literature, history, and culture. He's held positions at Texas A&M University um, and also the Virginia Military Institute, of which he's a graduate. 
Dr. Coleman chairs, uh, chairs as an advisor and strategist for the New Mexico Black History Month Coordinating Committee. That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> Um, he's also the founder of the Delcy Group, uh, and for more than 20 years, Dr. Coleman has worked as a higher education consultant specializing in diversity, equity, and inclusion on college campuses. Prior to his career in academia, Dr. Coleman served as a United States Army intelligence officer in Germany, Saudi Arabia, and also Kuwait during the Gulf and Persian War. Persian Gulf War. Ah, it was a war. War is not good. <laughs> Just exactly. Uh, and we will continue with Dr. Finney Coleman's introductory word, words right now. Dr. Coleman, are you with us? Can you hear? Can you hear us? Good afternoon from Prague. Good morning to the U.S. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm glad to be with you. Um, okay, Could, are we able to see Dr. Fitt? I mean, we can, oh, there you are, hello. <laughs> okay, so um, basically you are the, the more of an expert than we are. I don't want to use the word expert loosely, but in my ex compared to my experience, you are the expert. <laughs> um, and I'd just like to ask you, uh, what is Black Lives Matters for someone who really has absolutely no idea? Just, um, I don't want to be offensive, but you can, you can dumb it down for us. Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter is a contemporary movement um, for civil rights and social justice in the United States. Um, it's difficult to kind of talk much about uh, Black Lives Matter, unless you know some of its history, uh, some people would tend to put it right in the chain of events that marked the civil rights movements in the United States, especially in the 1960s, um, more close to that moment when the Black Lives Matter movement gets started is actually the Occupy movement. And the Occupy movement begins in Tunisia with the immolation of um, uh, Tarek uh, Bouassisi, Mohammed Tarek Bouassisi, in December of 2010. And then a series of events uh, that led to the downfall of many um, leaders in the Middle East. Um, the most uh, important of those leaders, probably Muammar Gaddafi and Hosni Mubarak, uh, and Mubarak, who uh, fell from power um, in February of uh, 2011. And then that energy finding itself uh, in Zuccotti Park uh, in, in New York City in September of, of 2011. Uh, and then from that point on, we, we, you must know um, about the history of George Zimmerman and the shooting of Trayvon Martin. Um, in July of 2013, Zimmerman was acquitted of all charges related to, shoot, to the shooting death of, of Trayvon Martin, who was just 17 years old at the time. Um, Alicia Garza posted a, a love note to black people to Facebook, which contained the phrase, our lives matter, black lives matter. And later on, she's going to, uh, to partner with Patrice Cullors and April Tometi also um, activists, and they're going to take the, le the, the lessons from um, the Arab Spring to help shape that movement. In truth, it's not until um, August of 2014 that we see the movement coalesce, that we see that energy that we saw in Zuccotti Park and other places around the world, um, the use of social media and techno technology and probably most important to the success of those movements, the decentralized leadership style. And the, this next phase in Black Lives Matter, uh, if, you, if you will, um, began with the unfortunate death of, of, of George Floyd um, 
in May of 2020. And then Brianna Taylor earlier that year, in March of that year. So we've had the, this, this, this uh, movement that's punctuated by these high profile uh, killings by police officers in the United States. Black Lives Matter is uh, an effort to address police brutality, but also to look at global issues like slavery around the world. And here most recently, Black Lives Matter has been very interested in the crisis de de developing on the US southern border with Mexico with Haitian refugees that have been maltreated there. Uh, that's a, a thumbnail sketch of Black Lives Matter. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think it does, um, or at least it gives us a good, uh, a good base of understanding. Uh, I have one other quick question, uh, because a lot of times Black Lives Matter is being uh, presented as a terrorist group or, or as, uh, they're lumping it in with terrorist activity. Do you think this could be because of its roots in the Arab Spring and, and people just want to lump uh, prejudices together? Um, I think it's a combination of things. Certainly that's part of it. Um, there's a long history in the United States uh, over the struggle for control of the public image of blackness. That if you can control that image on the radio, if you can control that image on television, in film, um, here if you can control that, um, that image in, uh, on the internet, then you have a chance of swaying public opinion about black organizations, the black community in general. Um, black Lives Matter um, is in the midst of that struggle. Uh, you would think that with the internet and the ability to um, stream live video or to share our individual messages through social media, that those forces in the United States that are contrary to social change would not have as much control or power as they do. But I think what's been surprising to me, at least as a historian of these things, is just how adept um, groups in the United States who are racist, white supremacist, have been able to use social media to their advantage and to provide remarkable levels of misinformation about the Black Lives Matter movement. Misinformation that many people have used to form their opinions about the organization without ever having a real look at its platform uh, or the things that it's actually trying to accomplish. Okay. Um, and can you uh, maybe help us draw some parallels between w what happened in the 60s with the civil rights movement and uh, what's happening today? Because, I mean, I think a lot of people have this idea that uh, we had uh, Malcolm X, we had Dr. Martin Luther King, and I think you have these images that uh, Malcolm X was a radical, uh, well, again, going back to falling into the terrorist type of thing, whereas everyone sees Martin Luther King Jr. as this sort of peace-loving, uh, peaceful, passive resistance. But was it always like that, or was it, was it ever similar to what's going on with Black Lives Matter today? Was anything like that? Is there some parallel between that and, and the 1960s? Yes, actually, you, you could go back to the Harlem Renaissance um, when we see the deportation of, my, of Marcus Garvey. And, and interestingly enough, the person who was responsible for uh, deporting Marcus Garvey from the United States or, or having success with that was none other than J. Edgar Hoover. At the time, he was a very young FBI agent. He's going to eventually become the head of the FBI. And in the 1960s, oh, he's going to, you know, persecute uh, civil rights organizations from, you know, the 1920s uh, to the end of his career. But in the 1960s, he's the architect of COINTELPRO, this program by the, the Federal Bureau of Investigations to infiltrate and to destabilize civil rights organizations, um, to include Dr. King's organization, and of course, um, Malcolm X's organization, the Nation of Islam, uh, but CORE, SNCC, SCLC, the, the FBI literally set about 
to destroy uh, those organizations. So we should not be surprised that um, there are parallels between what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement today and what happened in the 1960s. I think the biggest rivalry perhaps um, uh, with Black Lives Matter uh, has been with former President Trump, um, who was openly and outwardly against uh, the organization, everything that it stood for, and was able to bring his followers uh, to, to bear on the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's a very complex relationship. It has always been very complex. Um, the organizations in the United States and, and other parts of the world as, as well have always had to struggle against established sitting power, uh, hegemonic power in the case of the United States, that's, that's international. Um, how do you go against that juggernaut? Uh, and that's what these organizations have always been up against. They've always struggled, but interestingly enough, they've always managed to have some modicum of success as well. Uh, so there are really remarkable um, parallels uh, between what's happening now and in the 1960s. I would also point up too, um, in the 1960s, I think women's roles in these organizations um, were overshadowed by the charismatic men who wound up leading organizations. But if you really want to see the architect of Black Lives Matter, you should read about Ella Baker and her ideas regarding group leadership as opposed to individualized leadership. Uh, so yes, you're, it's a great question, hard to answer in a short period of time, but there are many, many parallels between the civil rights movements of the 1960s and what we're experiencing today with Black Lives Matter around the world. Um, thank you for that. Um, here with us in person, uh, on the stage, uh, Tomashu introduce, and maybe you can take over. I will with pleasure. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for opening our debate. Um, we will turn uh, to our panel here in Prague, indeed. Dr. Harvey, uh, what is, according to you, important for us to really understand from your experience as we understand the global movement today. When did you actually begin to be active in the civil rights movement, please? Thank you for the opportunity of being able to discuss the history of civil rights and the role that people like myself played in that history. I think it's perhaps a good idea if you get an idea of how I happen to be involved at all. People often think that I must have Czech ancestors because of my love and my commitment to the Czech Republic. And the closest I can say is that I live 10 miles away from where Dvořák spent the summer when he was in the United States. Unfortunately, I do not have Czech ancestors. I might know the language a little better if I did. The other thing that people might not expect from me is the fact that I have been involved with Native Americans living close to an, an Indian reservation, the Seneca Nation in New York. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Are they not hearing me? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for getting feedback from Cindy, if you could mute you, or if in the tech panel you could mute the Zoom team for getting the feedback. Actually, we're getting feedback. They're from the stage. Yes? Yes, it's not the stage. Yes. Testing, one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, that's no, it's not the microphone. Microphone. Okay, try again. I was just going to, to introduce the reasons why I got involved in the civil rights movement. I was in high school when the tragic death of a young man from Chicago was murdered in Mississippi. I just heard on the radio last week the memory of, of his life, and they were mistaken. They said he was lynched. He wasn't lynched, he was tortured and murdered. And the people who did it, of course, were found innocent in the southern courtroom, after which they sold their story and made a lot of money telling how they actually tortured this 13-year-old child. That happened when I was in high school. That really got my attention. The next thing that happened to me is that I was able to uh, learn more about uh, the whole history of the United States, the Civil War. I studied history 
in the university. I was also studying other minority groups and immigrant groups. And I've always been interested in all of these people and tried to find out why, if they were ill-treated, Ill this was true. I found myself then uh, living in a small community in upstate New York, a city of about 25,000 with a university and uh, business community uh, manufacturing as, uh, right after I graduated from college. And there was a notice in the paper because of what was happening with Martin Luther King Jr. If anyone was interested in civil rights, there was going to be a meeting held at a church on a particular night. And I went. And one of the things that came out of that meeting was the opportunity to put together panel discussions on civil rights in our own community. We did not really realize, uh, those of us who were not victims of this, that it existed. We found that segregation was part of the New York uh, community, that people had to live in a certain area if they were not, if they were not white, that they had to go to only one church, whether they wanted to go to another one or not, that they couldn't get professional jobs even if they had academic credentials. So we put together these panels because I was the youngest person. I didn't really have anything to do except introduce the speakers. We always had four panelists. Two were black and two were white. One was a lawyer, one was a clergyman. The people from the black community were the most important because they told us what it was like to be living in Olean, New York, and the opportunities that were not theirs. It was an incredible experience because we often had more people on the panel than we had in the audience, but sometimes we had several hundred people in the audience, and it made a difference. We ended up, by the time we had done this for several years, with having black teachers in the school system for the first time. We ended up having black firemen, black policemen, and we had people integrating the churches instead of being assigned to a particular church. We also found that the restaurants were not integrated, and we were able to deal with that as well. So we had a major impact in that community at the same time that everything in the South was turning toward uh, reactions, violence against Dr. King and his followers, police dogs, fire hoses, really frightening things. It almost made me think, as I had studied the fascist movement, that this was a real hazard in the United States. So I was able to feel that we had done something in one community. I wish that I could go and do something elsewhere. But I have to say that my family uh, were in the South. My parents were the only ones who migrated to Ohio. And the rest of my cousins and uncles and aunts and grandparents all lived in the South. And I'm happy to tell you today that one of my cousins, a pediatrician, and his wife adopted six children whom he saw in a, a, when he was doing research in metabolic diseases in babies. And these babies were just left in cribs without anyone to touch them or take care of them. So he and his wife ended up adopting six of them. One was Native American, two were black Americans, one was Irish American, and I can't remember who the other one was. But they did a great job raising those children in the South. All of them have grown up and have high, highly uh, qualified positions. They've been well educated. And they managed to somehow make a difference in the South. Now one of my granddaughters, who graduated from college two years ago studying art, is doing art for Black Lives Matter. She's doing paintings and drawings and selling them. And the money is going to Black Lives Matter so that we see this stretching out over generations of people attempting to make a difference. Thank you so much. Now I thank you uh, so much. Um, I think we'll get back to this. This is a great uh, opening uh, from the Prague panel, as I put it. And now let's continue with our next guest. And Tonya, you go ahead. Um, we'll hear next from uh, Chuck Seaton. Uh, who was introduced earlier. Uh, Chuck, you are here eight years, uh, which is, so you've been, you've been here a shorter time than me, 
but you've been in the States a longer time than me. So uh, for me, people often ask, oh, well, what's it like? How is it possible there's racism in America? You had a black president, all of this kind of craziness. But I haven't been there in quite a long time. I haven't lived there, so I don't, I'm not as in touch with it as you are, even though you've been here eight years. Um, can you tell me what is important to, or explain for us here, what's important to understand about the America that you and I were born in and the America that's happening today. Hello. Oh, there we yes. go. So, um, part of the major differences that um, that I see as as growing up, um, uh, and I'll speak more of, of Chicago, because like like Europe, America, I'm a Midwestern. I come right. from Chicago, so the East Coast, the South, the West, and Mountain. We're all different regions, and we all we all interact differently. So right. when I'll speak, I'll speak about the Midwest because at Chicago we are okay. the capital. So Chuck is our Chicago representative. <laughs> We've had upstate New York in the South. I also come from upstate New York, but okay, give us your Midwest. Well, <laughs> overall, it's I see it as uh, the divide. Uh, for me, the civil rights movement, even though we were liberated to be free to migrate with everybody, it still, it drew a divide. Because once, once, black, once segregation opened, black communities actually went down, in my opinion. We were dependent on it ourselves. We needed the black doctors. We needed the black plumbers. And in the sense of, of our history, we've always been chasing white superiority. Once, once black people were able to roam freely, they wanted the Jewish lawyer. They wanted that white doctor. Because for them, that was the pinnacle of being successful in America. Is by, you know, you know, we we lost part of our greatness. And to a certain degree, Martha Luther King for me was a martyr for White, corpor white, white corporalism for, for America. His, his speeches about freedom and the people, his main goal was to unify all poor people of all colors. And if you understand capitalism in America, that's a red flag. Just like in Chicago with young Fred Hampton, uh, mm -hmm. he was assassinated. And what was his goal? To unify all people. In the sense of just by, I, I say that because I, I, I love my country and my country's smart. Most of us are walking around playing checkers. America's playing chess. So though, you know, at the time of Martin Luther King's assassination by, by Edgar, he was considered a terrorist when he was killed. What terrorist do you know is the motto of freedom? That for me tells you right there, but to get back into nowadays, uh, between gentrification, education, health, our communities, our communities have gone down from even from mom, pa, in the last 20 years in Chicago, I, I came to fame as, a, as a doing marketing with lifestyles. Mom, pops, so when I say mom, pops, these are local shops. So your, your local grocery store, your local record store, all these shops have been eaten by Target, Walmart. So even now, like in communities, our communities as far as businessmen and role models, who do our kids see as black kids? And when I say that, I say A-D-O-S, meaning black American descendants of slavery. That's of my generation, that's what, that's what I like to be called because it gives a distinction of who I am. No disrespect to any Africans, but I am a black American from slavery. If a Nigerian man moves to America and becomes, citizen, becomes a citizen, he is technically an African American. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't trust America, we don't trust America. We can't allow them to box us in because what they will do is strip us of our history off that and place and us in a box. I don't, I don't want really mean to interrupt, but a quick question. So 
Uh, your point about, and it is true, that a lot of uh, the, the things like black, all black towns, all black businesses after slavery had ended in the late 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, we, we know, well, we don't all know the history, but there are so many towns that were completely razed to the ground or communities destroyed just because they were black. But um, do you think that separate but equal is better? Or do you think that it's a, it's that's very true? It's a fine a line, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a dangerous it's a dangerous slope. Yeah. Um, and I'll say I, I, you know, he's the person I'll say he's uh, he's hated by most. I listen to the minister Farrakhan because, in the sense of all black leaders, I know he's got my back more than anybody, because I know. Um, but it's it's a fine. I I don't I. I don't want segregation, but I want black people to build with, with within themselves because black people, as we we're the only culture in America who do not have unity. That's we're, true. We're that, the that, only that we're the only true. community where Koreans, Indians, and foreigners can come into our neighborhoods and sell us sugar and alcohol, and they get easy loans from the government to do this. And this is by design, so we, I wish we could pull it back in. And the thing is, pulling it back in doesn't mean we don't have to relate. Pulling it back in means pulling the black dollar back into our communities and circling it through ourselves. And that's the segregation that we need, is our economics to come back to us like it was before the Civil Rights Act took place. We have that established. We were dependent on ourselves. We were strong. We were building everything ourselves. And that's what America was afraid of. And so for me, the civil rights movement was a long-term goal. And as I said, King was the, was the anchor to get everybody aboard. And while we're sitting here crying, playing checkers with King, the United States, the civil rights movement for me was not about opening it up to all black people within people. Mm -hmm. It was about forcing white corporations to take black dollars. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, that diminished part of our community. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to take a quick moment to, I mentioned earlier that joining us today also would be Kelsey Roman. Hello, Kelsey. Hello. Um, Kelsey is, well, actually, Kelsey's great. She's young like you guys sitting here in the audience. And uh, she is uh, the next generation like you guys in activism. Uh, let's see what we got here with my little Kelsey. Sorry. Okay. So, okay, so you're studying, so you're currently studying at Charles University, okay, for a master's in international economics and politics. Um, Kelsey has been living in Prague since 2019, working as an English teacher, and uh, she actually helped organize the Black Lives Matter protests in Prague in June of 2020. Um, and she is linked to the activist community across the Czech Republic. Uh, welcome, Kelsey. Welcome, Kelsey, also from my side. Um, let me just um, ask uh, from your perspective, uh, what does the global movement of the Black Lives Matter actually mean to you at this point of your life? So my understanding of Black Lives Matter is that it is fundamentally grassroots, which means it comes from the people, it is of the people. It is them championing their rights, their right to, to life, to liberty, to property. To it starts off within the American context as something that has to do very much with livelihood. You know, we have issues of police brutality. We have issues where uh, people are being killed for the color of their skin. And so it starts off with the championing of the right to life. But the idea of Black Lives Matter is that you can, as a community, champion your rights, whatever contextually they may be, and that's something that could be applied to many different communities around the world now. It's about sort of empowering from within. So personally, as someone who is American by birth, 
been spent most of my life in America, but now has the privilege to live abroad and experience different social structures. Um, I would like to see the kind of enthusiasm for self-championing um, that Black Lives Matter inspires um, create similar movements in communities such as the Czech Republic. Like, I would like to see Roma Lives Matter. I would like to see in different parts of the world people saying, okay, here are our issues, here are the things and the challenges that we face, and we will stand up and educate the world about what it is we're going to going through and, and talk about what it is that we need in return from the community. Uh, and that's what I think Black Lives Matter has to offer the world, and that's really the kind of transition that I like to encourage as an activist, you know, using the developments of American politics to help provide a platform for other communities to promote themselves. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, you said, or we said actually, that um, you helped to organize uh, the protests here in Prague. Um, could you tell us what this experience was like? Uh, is there anything that we have in common with the situation in the US, or is it very different? How was it? Sure. So. When we initially organized Black Lives Matter, um, it was myself and a few other American expats who were hoping to do it in solidarity uh, with the movement as it was happening in America. We didn't feel that we were like in a place or, or had enough knowledge really to make comment on the Czech situation and, and, and Czech sort of dynamics with minorities. However, the sort of response that this initial like solidarity evoked in Czech media. Um, I read all sorts of things, you know, saying like there was a leftist agenda and and this is, uh, you know, not about black lives. If there's someone came to Czech parliament with a sign that said all lives matter at, and a shirt that said black lives don't matter as black lives, which it proved to me that there's something here about Black Lives Matter that resonates and it upsets people. And so I started to kind of poke into that and try to understand what is it about discussing minorities or, you know, opening up uh, Czech society to the idea of like further diversity that is challenging people or rubbing them the wrong way. And for me, it helps me realize at least that although there are issues here around maybe not enough discussions happening or these discussions um, of diversity not including um, certain minority voices. For example, the Czech media will talk about um, what's happening to black America, but are they often reflecting on what's happening here to uh, the Ukrainian minorities, to the Roma minorities, to the Vietnamese minorities, are they doing that self-reflection? Well, I noticed there's not a lot of discussion about that. I also realized that the American approach of getting out into the streets and screaming about things creates a defensiveness, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that, that brings uh, the Czech community to the table to want to discuss. Uh, so for me, Organizing Black Lives Matter here actually helped give me a deeper introduction, although accidentally, to activism within the Czech Republic and uh, discourse within the Czech Republic around minorities. Thank you, Kelsey. I just have one really quick, <laughs> one quick question, uh, because uh, uh, the whole All Lives Matters, uh, I'm sure that uh, I think a lot of people still really agree with that statement. Well, all lives matter, and I have to admit I was one of them. But uh, I think, um, I'm not sure how you, you transfer Black Lives Matter here, because uh, yes, all lives matter, but if black lives don't matter, if Roma lives don't matter, if Vietnamese lives don't matter, then all lives can't matter, can they? That's exactly right. Um, the way that I would make the distinction 
is it's about helping the people that are in the most immediate need. And within the American context, we need to say Black Lives Matter because historically, they have not been treated as such. All Lives Matter is something that is so inherent that it shouldn't need to be said. Um, it's something that we all know within our society, deep within our souls. So when we are pointing out Black Lives Matter or other Lives Matter for that matter, <laughs> for that matter, um, we are really referencing a value that already exists that doesn't need to be spoken, which is that all lives matter, which is something that we know inherently. So oftentimes when people are responding with all lives matter, they are missing the, the point of, of dedicating resources and energy to helping that be true, to embracing that value for everyone. If you're using it to shut down the, uh, the idea that someone is suffering, then you yourself are not actually embracing the value that you want to espouse. Thank you, that's a, that's a, that's a really good answer. Um, and I hope, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm just completely like, wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, indeed. Um, now, if that is possible, let me turn one more time to Dr. Coleman and see if he can hear us, if he's still with us. I would be just wondering, uh, Dr. Coleman, if uh, now when hearing about the situation in the Czech Republic, um, is this something uh, that you um, hear about also from other places around the globe? Or what is actually the perception of the global movement um, abroad? I mean, out of the US, uh, we're here on a slightly different planet here in the Central Europe. So I'm just wondering what is the rest of the world doing with this? Right. Well, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement kind of tracks um, different protests and the like that, you know, use the moniker Black Lives Matter. And those protests have been around the world. So there, are, there have been many protests um, in disparate parts of the, of the globe that use that. I think the perception, um, you know, the local versus the international perspective, um, you know, from in the United States, we very rarely see very much anymore about what Black Lives Matter is doing in the United States. There's almost been a moratorium, if you will, on covering uh, Black Lives Matter sponsored events. I honest and honestly can't remember the last time I saw on network television um, uh, or, or cable news in the United States, um, you know, any kind of significant mention of Black Lives Matter. I think that's part of a strategy. I think it's part of a, a, a broader effort to um, to marginalize uh, these voices. I think you're probably seeing some of the same things in the Czech Republic, that there are folk who do not want to hear what um, people who are involved in this movement or who are involved in change in that country have to say. And, the, and the, one of the best ways of, of quelling dissent is silencing the, the dissenter. Uh, and so, you know, state apparatus around the world, it seemed to me, are vested in uh, making sure that we don't hear a great deal about these these uh, these movements, at least in mainstream media. You can always, of course, go to websites, go to uh, spe spe uh, special spaces in the on the internet to find that information. But in terms of widespread global coverage, it's very hard to to to, to hear very much about this movement. Uh Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, just one, uh, uh, something else. Um, what would you suggest, the, or how do you suggest that uh, we're in a country with like 90% of, uh, of the population? It's quite homogenous. Um, how do you suggest that we could do things to support this movement, the global movement of trying to bring this in, an end to inequality? I mean, if that, is that question to me? It's not to me, is it? Yes, yes, yes. It is to me? Yes. Yes. Well, I think the, the most important piece is to, is to um, um, be in no ways tired. It's sometimes easy to give up on these types of movements when you don't see the kind of progress, uh, you know, as, as quickly or as rapidly as you, 
as you would like. Remember that this is a long end game, that this is not something that you just do over the summer and, you know, change comes about and, and everything is done. That, that's not the way that this kind of um, activism works. It takes patience. Um, it takes dedication. And so stick to it. Um, and so in, in terms of supporting uh, Black Lives Matter uh, internationally or globally, I think making sure that your voice is heard on that national stage is important um, to make sure that what you're doing is shared out with the rest of the world. Hearing your voice is the best way of supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to be clear, I'm not part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not in one of the chapters. I teach a course on Black Lives Matter, um, but I, I'm not um, within that organization. The other thing that I would suggest is to reach out to the people who are within the movement and speak directly to them about their direct action and what they're doing and what they need. Um, that, that would be my guidance on that question. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, Dr. Harvey, uh, based on your experience with the Czech society, uh, what is there that you would um, advise uh, in order to support the movement uh, for equality? Well, I would like to enhance what Dr. Coleman has said by saying that the thing that made my life what it is was learning, was education. And one of the things I've been able to do here that I'm very happy with is to introduce Czech students at Charles University to African-American literature, to African-American achievement. I just feel that that's probably the best step toward understanding and appreciating what people have done and what people are doing. We made a big mistake in my generation when we passed the Civil Rights Act. We thought we had won the battle, but we had not won the battle. Racism is alive and well, and we have to recognize that it's an ongoing educational experience that's absolutely essential. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, would you agree? <laughs> Do you agree? Would yeah, you, oh, I, I definitely agree. It was just so much said. I was just, uh, just, I was just trying to think of something to add on. Uh, but yeah, the, what they've touched on is, yeah, yeah, it's definitely education, edu uh, education and health, edu education and health. Uh, knowing that self, it's, it's beneficial. Thank you, Kelsey. I would like to add that, although education from a factual standpoint really helps us kind of quantify issues of like quality of life. I mean, education is something that we can look at how someone lives, how long they live, how often they will get sick, how often they get put in jail, uh, you know, how far they achieve, how much money they make, and we can measure their quality of life. And education helps us understand that. But to go even further, Empathy helps us understand the feeling of that sort of life. And I would not only say that we need to uh, focus on promoting educational pursuits that explain the achievements of uh, minorities, um, not just African American people, but minorities in various communities. I would not only say that we need to do that, but we need to try to expand how we empathize because particularly the Czech Republic, it's a very homogenous uh, group. You know, you have 90% or so of people who are ethnically Czech um, and it can be easy for people to say, okay, this is what it is to be Czech. Um, and I come from people who have always been Czech and not try and understand as much the person who is in the process of becoming Czech, the families that are coming here that are, are trying to embrace life here and are in the process of, of being Czech. Uh, they are in this transitional phase and to kind of try and identify with them and help support them in that process um, with empathy is what I really think will make the difference uh, 
not just education of understanding the facts, but understanding the feeling and the experience that they go through. So with, with education in that sense is like, um, like for me, I live, in, I live in East Prague and education that I do is throwing myself in. Like a favorite story that I, um, I used to work for uh, one of Bobish's social clubs and uh, they, there's a big bike race uh, all through the country, y'all. Uh, I can't. We need to say who Bob is. Uh, Do we really? Uh, uh, Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 okay. If you uh, don't know, then don't. Oh, yeah, I just assumed. <laughs> no, no, uh, I know, I know, but. Uh, uh, okay, the, equal opportunity. Prime Minister, uh, the, the leader who used to be the finance minister. Uh, so. So like I throw myself in. So uh, if you worked for Bobish, you uh, he sponsors you for these uh, what is it, Bike for Life, uh, yeah. Proja, uh, whatever, Colo, uh, <laughs> and so I have an Agrofat jersey. So I'll go, I'll go into like the Salzavar near the Salzavar River in the Benishoff area and ride my bike. And it's always wonderful if you bike ride in the Czech. There's always pubs in the forest. So I'll show up, I'll show up in the forest pub and, you know, come in and speak to Czech people as you do. Dobre, dobre, Valky Pivo Procin. And, you know, and they're like, Tevla, Tevla, Jeno, hella bobbish. Uh-huh, he's bringing in the blacks. And it's like, you know, so it's like in before three or four pivots in, they'll be the, they're, they're drawn to me like mosquitoes to light, you know, and they want to know. What are you doing with that bobbish jersey on? And you know, and before, you know, and this is how I, with education that I mean is diversity. I throw myself in there to have conversation. I understand Czech culture. So that way, and that's the education that, that I mean is by actually experiencing the people and actually stand, understanding the culture in that sense. Okay, uh, but just a quick question. I wanna know what you're doing with that jersey on. <laughs> Why are you wearing an, uh, an agrofert bobbish? Because uh, it's a conversation piece, just like I said. It's a conversation. Yeah, it's, a he's right, because man, we're about ready to get down on this cause, conversation. Cause Do you know who that man is? Do you I, know I work, what you're wearing I on worked, yourself? I worked for him for two years, and, <laughs> and in Sokolona Pohinitsa, I was amazed. As much as you guys say he's hated, I used to watch this man with no security sit in his bar. As a, me, as an American, that would be amazing. That's amazing that he's so secure because... But the thing is... Okay, we're here about active, civic activism in America. Uh, they, no, I know I went there, but we need to stick to that because this Mr. Bobbish, that's a whole other thing. And, and uh, we ain't got time for that today, but I will school you after this. Hey, let me add uh, to this, you know, with my professional Chenglish, that, so that we are not lost in translation for my students and for Dr. Coleman uh, back in the U.S., uh, the most important Czech word uh, is pivo, you know, that's beer, right? And that's uh, what Chuck just mentions here, and it's part of his uh, strategy, and I think part, part, part of the most um, vital amount of uh, Czechs as well. Yes. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> Tonya, if yes. you don't mind, including all our panelists, I would yes. suggest to turn to the auditory now okay. and actually check uh, with uh, our guests here in the hall who are there with us if uh, they have something to say, yes, thank you for the lights. I mean, we are sitting here uh, in Prague with the exception of uh, Dr. Coleman, and I'm wondering uh, what um, brought you all here and what um, does activism actually mean to you? Anyone who would like to start, please. There's the first hand. Hi, my name is Martin. Hello, Martin. And I wonder if you would like to hear from an uh, average American white person. Uh, yeah, but uh, that wouldn't be you. <laughs> yes, it is. Really? Yes. Okay, so I'd like to hear from this average um, uh, Czech black woman would like to hear from this average... I was born in Czechoslovakia. Okay, no, no, but your average American white man, you say. Average American white man. But no, but that's the Average that's American what I'm white man is who has a family, mm -hmm. lives, has a work, live, was born, lives, works, and dies. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was born in Czechoslovakia. I immigrated when I was 15 years old. Okay. Now I live, I represent West Coast. 
I live 15 miles from Portland, Oregon. No, I'm sorry, 35 miles from Portland, Oregon. So I am very familiar with what you've been talking here about. Okay, and I'm, I apologize for my accent because I don't hear very I know, well. it's strange for a typical white, jet, uh, white American male, but anyway, go on, and continue. Well, I, I, I know the feeling. I'm not gonna be offended and you're not gonna try to. I'm not offended, I'm just making a joke, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, and I'm a normal person, so I, I accept your apology. Uh, I have a few comments. First, there is a Black Lives Matter movement, and there is a Black Lives Matter organization. And I think those two are not complementary. The Black Lives Matter organization is a Marxist-Leninist organization. Dr. Finney, any comments on that? Um, well, no, no, he has two things, so I would like for yeah, Dr. Our, Finney to comment on both of those. So first, uh, uh, Martin? Martin? Yes, Martin, uh, our representative average white American male, says that the, there are two different types. Hello? Yes, there are two different, yeah. there are two different, yeah. Well, so there's the, the Marxist. And then there is the organization. Okay, so which part did you say was Marxist? The organization. Okay, so he says the organization is Marxist. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think... Um, Trying to talk to a human a, being a, here. Yeah, I have a, 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 a couple of thoughts on that. Um, the first is that we somehow talk about um, if, if an organization is Marxist, it's somehow like saying that the organization is liberal or conservative or the like that somehow even if those tendencies were true, which I'm, I'm not sure I agree with, but even if those were true, I'm not sure that that would distract from or take away from uh, the important work that that organization is trying to accomplish. Um, whether it's a communist organization, an atheist organization, um, anything that we might not agree with ideologically, you also have to look at the works of the organization. This is a red herring argument that somehow the politics of the or argument um, somehow diminish uh, the effectiveness of the organization or the validity of the organization and the like. It is a straw argument. It is true, however, that there is a Black Lives Matter movement and a Black Lives Matter organization. The organization tries to support the movement and the movement often has nothing to do with the organization. Uh, they are very different things. Uh, but with that said, I would caution us about, you know, the, it, it's, it's very, it's not much more than mere name calling that uh, I guess the, 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 the so if, if the organization were to say, yes, we are a Marxist organization, does that mean somehow we are supposed to abandon our own opinions, thoughts, ideas, principles that govern our activism? I, I don't think so. I think the same type of arguments were used to um, dissuade people from supporting the civil rights movement. Dr. King was often called a communist or a Marxist. Uh, Malcolm X was often called a communist or a Marxist. Uh, even back in the day, Garvey was maligned for his, his politics. So we have to be careful. I understand where that, cut, that question is coming from. We've seen that energy up close and personal. Um, but I don't think that we can countenance it. We have to recognize that it exists, but we have to continue on with the work that we're doing. And I don't mean to dismiss our, our, our colleague here. I'm sure that he comes from a good space, but understand that that question comes up every time. People of color, minority groups, people who've been oppressed, um, that question comes up almost uh, predictably as a way to somehow shift our attention away from the most important goals at hand. So with all due respect, I, I understand the question and I hope that you accept my answer to it. Okay, and the second I, part? I accept your answer. However, the, the, I know that the Marxist organization is not working for the democratic process in the United States. And also, on top of that, some of the members of the organizations are very, I would say, crooked. Some of the money that has been given to the organizations have been misappropriated. 
and that's all in the news, and, and it's all over. Well, that's, uh, and I, uh, and the I question, don't want to go but in the there. Question, I the have, question. I have, I have more, I have more, more. I would like to talk to about the gentleman over there, if I may. Yes, go for it, please. May I? Sure. Sure. You? Go, okay. Go. Uh, the gentleman is following Mr. Farrakhan, who is, who is very, very, uh, I would say, anti-societal. He, he's against the Jews. He's against some blacks. He's against Catholics. He can't, he's really, uh, it's, uh, he's a very divisive person. You yourself, I believe you are a very nice person. You will. Sure. You are a very nice person, but you're wearing a sweatshirt of an athlete. From I'm sorry to interrupt because we have limited time and we have more questions, but if you have an yes. actual question, can you please pose it so that we can get on no, to the I, other people? Thank you. I have a question for him. No, no, great. I need to hear the question because others would like to also ask questions. You will. How do you think that for instance, with the sweatshirt like what you have from the Olympic champion in, 1968. in Mexico City no. in 1980, 68. with his 68, 1968. How do you think that the other population in the United States feel when you try to segregate yourself from them? The United States had 325 million population. Yes, I agree. There are some people that are uh, prejudiced, like everywhere in the world. <laughs> Czech country had, Czechoslovakia or can, Czech Republic can has problems. Can I, can I reply Thomas, to you? Uh, there are Britons, the, the Germans. Have can I, can I reply to you? Because yes. I said we have yes. little time, and I understood, you you understood what you were going, be, the first sentence. To be a uh, peacemaker, let's say. OK, so let, me, let me talk. So first of all, when I spoke, I said I listened. I listened to the Minister Farrakhan. And then what I said is, for, for all black leaders that I, that I follow, I believe Farrakhan has more love for me as a black than anybody else, and in my leaders. Yes, that's the, you, 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 hit all the, you hit all the conservative talking points about the minister, but have you ever listened to him? And that's the thing, because he's talking to me as a black person. And when I spoke earlier, I t said, and I told you it was a slippery slope. I didn't want to go down there. I don't want segregation. But I said, I believe that bringing our black dollar back to us is essential. And I know everything that's said about Farrakhan. But the thing is, the power, if you, you want to, hit the conservative points of everything that he hates Jews and blah, blah, blah. These are talking points. But I know when every black leader needs something to happen, they go to Farrakhan for support. They can't, he can't go to support for them because of all the talking points that you said because they'll be demonized. And I'll leave it, I'll, I'll leave it as that. It's just the fact that I spoke upon it. Black people don't have unity if we could bring our dollar back into our communities, we would have a lot more power. And that's the aspect that I listen to as far as what Farrakhan's talking about. Thank but you. That's a really very good point. We have a question over here. I was really, uh, sorry, my name is Hisham El Nagar, a teacher at the International School of Prague here. And I was really thankful that Dr. Coleman mentioned the connections of trying to take down Marxist groups or groups that are considered communist in the 1960s with MLK and Martin Luther King Jr. because some analyzed that the civil rights movement was really a, a power play that really that reflected the Cold War tensions between the US and the USSR and civil rights wasn't actually a full agenda item towards racial equality. But my question is these tropes of of identifying groups as, let's say, fascist or Marxist or uh, dangerous are coming up a lot in US politics, but also this week here in Czech politics. And I'm curious for the people who've done activist work, how do you engage with these really old misinformed and actually misconceptions? 
And that's a question for and for Keely, I'd say. She's our new she's our new generation, maybe for Keely and also for Norma. But uh, Keely, you want to take this one? Hi, I'm Kelsey. Uh, just want to make that clear very quickly. Um, OK, so it really is an excellent question. And um, the way my understanding of how to appeal to people, uh, particularly people who are operating under the fear of misunderstanding um, that the truer intentions behind a movement, those who fear, you know, extreme leftism, for example. Oftentimes they have a straw man that they're attacking. They have this idea of like maybe one public figure that has done something questionable because people are imperfect, politicians especially, the people who are willing to stand up and get in front of a crowd, no offense to you guys, usually their flaws are going to be more visible, their mistakes are going to be more visible. So, you know, when people start kind of attacking this and saying like this is an example of leftism gone wrong, I try to bring it back to the very real examples of people's day-to-day -day lives because we are not fighting to promote, you know, one person in charge or one governmental system. At the end of the day, it's not what it's about. It's about improving the quality of life and, and the ability to retain life uh, for people who are vulnerable. Um, and I don't, I don't want to engage in a distraction about what sort of uh, political side these issues fall on because at the end of the day, Black Lives Matter shouldn't be a left-wing, right-wing sort of issue. The, the, the livelihood of people, human rights, it shouldn't be divisive in this way. Dr. Harvey, would you add on this? I just wanted to add one thing that I think I've always tried to live by. That when I said education, I did not mean just formal education. I meant people knowing someone of the group that they think is not acceptable. I would say that I often say to anyone who makes a prejudiced remark, whether it's about someone who's Muslim or someone who's black or someone who's Native American, or someone who's Chinese, or someone who's anything. How many people do you know? How many people do you know? It's knowing people that is really a major part of education. Thank you. Another question. There is a hand over there, please. Turn it on. Is it lit? Turn it on. Yeah. Excellent. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Anna here. I teach at um, University of New York in Prague. Um, I hi. <laughs> I I would like to build on what you already said about education. You touched a little bit about art and literature, and I would like to ask you about the role of music because that's very important for you know the 60s rights movement, civil rights movement, as well as Black Lives Matters, and you know this sort of informal edutainment especially so if you have any thoughts in that area chuck i mean as a as a person who grew up uh, as an american i my true culture is hip-hop it's it's storytelling poetry you know in the sense of it's, it's tells the art you know where it's sad, white kids fantasize about it, but these lyrics they talk about, it's reality. It's not, it's not a joke, you know. For the most part in a lot of our communities, the, the drug dealer, the pimp, these are the role models, these are the success stories they see every day. Because a lot of the, the business corporate people, they're gonna move to rich neighborhoods and so forth, but the music has always been the storytelling, from soul music, from jazz, from the, the hymns, from slavery. Music has always been a, a part of our culture of telling a true story. Thank you. I can't forget asking Dr. Coleman, actually, when seeing the wonderful amount of guitars just behind him. <laughs> hey, uh, that's true. What did you think, please? Is he here with us still? 
You're like turning to the sky here. I don't know. Um, if you're there with it, yeah, there he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can you please repeat the question? I'm having a little bit of trouble with my connection. Yeah, I actually made a very uh, clumsy um, introduction to that question. I see this uh, wonderful collection of guitars behind you. So we're actually discussing music here. So I was wondering what is your um, point on this? Or if you can... Uh... The connection between music and activism. Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, I study um, blues artists. My father was a blues guitarist. And um, I, I, I also play um, a little bit myself. And even the blues um, has been a vehicle for a protest. I mean, going back to uh, field shouts and field hollers um, to the spirituals, uh, uh, the Negro spirituals in, in this country's history, um, music has always been a manner, uh, a, a mode in which um, people of color in the United States have used to express themselves. Sometimes you can express yourself safely in a song in ways that you cannot uh, safely express yourself um, in um how do I put this, uh, in, 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 in the public square, so that you, you wind up having um, a much broader reach and a safer reach, if you will, uh, through, through music and, and, and activism. There's an there's uh, indelible link between the two of them. And then last but, last but not least, I have to ask you, Tanya, because you're a singer here with us, a professional singer. Please, what's your point on this, um, your take? I think, uh, I think music has its place in all kind of activism, not just uh, civil, or just everything. I mean, as far as the, I think the history of, of, of music with, with um, in, in America for black people is, uh, as you said, they sang in the fields, you got the blues. Blues had the jazz, it even had the country. But country, just like rock and roll, which was speeded up blues, they all stink of Elvis. Um, and oh. It's a very, very interesting uh, thing. I, I'd say when people, when I first came here, people always, oh, I love black music. And I didn't like that term. Because in that case, all, black, all music is black music unless we talk about Mozart. But anyway, I mean, even Dvorak, just saying. Anyway, uh, the point is, the mu this is not necessarily black music. I would call it Amer American immigrant music or American captive immigrant music. Because from the blues, you have jazz. From that, you get country, you get rock and roll, and all of these things. And rock and roll, uh, and country, are, uh, I don't want to be offensive, but I think they're basically a whitewashed version of the blues. The blues was speeded up, and that's how you got rock and roll. And that's how people like Elvis had such successes. Uh, two of his biggest hits were from a woman called Big Mama Thornton. She sang Hound Dog before he did. She sang Jailhouse Rock before he did. But not one of you in here probably ever heard that unless you've been on my concert. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that this music was a way, is a way for that people kind of kept it together. That's where you get your spirituals. It's like if you're however many hours out in a cotton field picking, sing a song and maybe it's not gonna seem so long. So uh, music does have a way, it uh, does have its place in activism, I think, in that it can unite people. It's like I'll be humming something and then maybe someone next to me hums and it sort of joins us. I think it does have a very uh, big place in activism. You saw it even with the, in the 60s, activists, uh, 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 especially the 60s, a lot of great music happened in the 60s because it was uh, protest music, not just civil rights, the Vietnam War, uh, ERA, all of these things. Music plays a very, very big part. Is there something that you wanted to say? I just wanted to add that when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came to our community, hundreds and hundreds of people came out to hear the songs, the protest songs, 
the songs that were made the 60s a time of, this is time for change. And everyone loved them. I mean, it was interesting to see people who were not always so open singing We Shall Overcome or when you don't see me at the front of the bus, back of the bus, come up front. You know, I mean, just all the songs that we had in the 60s were so important. And that was one of the things that I think allowed us to bring people together were, th were those songs. And I wish that, uh, I wish there were some now that would be doing the same thing. All right, let's continue. We have other Native Americans in the auditory, uh, such as my wonderful students from CET. Is there somebody who would like to comment or pose a question? If not, I'm not pushing this because I should be actually grateful that you're here with us. It's quite late after our session. <laughs> Anybody else? Any question? Any note? Yes, please. Chuck, you just mentioned it real briefly, but um, in a conversation that we had, you talked about ADOS. And I think that's, I had never come across that before, and then I was talking to Tanya about it as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and why you feel that that, that, not a label, that that definition is more comfortable for you? Because I think that was a question we had when we started this group a long time ago when we were saying, you know, should I use African American, should I use black? How do you prefer to be identified? And, and hearing you use that term to me was just like a huge light bulb. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Chuck? I, I guess it goes back to like kind of comedy with me. Like when, uh, I guess it was when Jesse Jackson uh, came out with the Afro-American term and it was like for black people, it was like, who sanctioned him? Who sanctioned him? Black King. Well, it's like I'm black, you know. It's like African American, but the term as a A D O S, and uh, it's more generational now. For like we're saying, we we see America. America's crafty. America isn't a joke. There is an agenda, and so A D O S is a statement to to put our footprint down that we built this fucking country. You're not going to take it from us. You're not going to box us out. We are original. We, if anybody, everybody, we're part of the community. And like I was saying that I just, and it's not disrespect towards any Africans that come to America, but if a Nigerian man moves to America and becomes an American citizen, he's an African American. Where does that lead in the end? You know, it was like, I'm proud of my history. You know, it was like, I'm proud to be, you know, it was like, uh, I'm a Seton. And, you know, I think that has more English and Irish backing as far as the slave masters. But I'm proud of what we did, what we built. And by no means necessary are we going to allow it to be diminished. And that's basically what the term ADOS means for me. I'm a black American descendant of slavery. And you can never take that from us because we're, we're, we're entity of America. And, and through education of how they're trying to change, the, change um, textbooks to redirect of how slavery happened. It was a trade system. It didn't have anything, you know, they make it seem like human trafficking wasn't part of it. Oh, it was just some 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 Spanish and some some Portuguese people, and they just happened to have some precious well, cargo. It's just business. Yeah, it's just we were we were just cargo. It wasn't people. So that's that's my personal tie, you know, as far as and I push Black Americans, and it's funny I I I put it out here. It's like I found out about this. Oh, you have the flag. I found out about this literally last month. The Black, the Black American Heritage flag. It was, I think, created in like 1961 in New Jersey. How is it possible? Did you know it's like the same thing with uh, with Tulsa, with Black Wall Street? How is it possible that there's a Black American Heritage flag, and 80% of Black people in America don't know about it? And this is what I mean, and why we have to protect our history because. It's being, it's being, it's being disponged. It's they're trying to pull it right from underneath us while we stand, 
And so that's why I feel so passionate. I was talking about, you know, so if you ever hear a black person say ADOS, get it. <laughs> I have to say, I really, this term really, I, I, it's the first time in, in my lifetime I have been colored, Negro, black. I never was down with African American because I have no history of Africa. And I remember when I was younger, we had on television, it was called Schoolhouse Rock. And thanks to this, tons, is that thing still on television? Okay. So uh, according to Schoolhouse Rock, I'm probably the most American person up in here. Well, maybe you guys are too because you're already that next generation. The Great American Melting Pot, do you guys know that one? Yeah, there you go, Great American Melting Pot. The Statue of Liberty, ships come in from all over the world and she takes them in and she makes this recipe and she mixes it all together and that's an American. See, that's who I am. But, uh, so this is why I had a problem with, uh, when I came to Europe, there, uh, for Africans, I'm not black because I'm not 100% black. But most of ADOSs are not. Uh, we have no history of Africa. Uh, we are just there. So the po when you make the point that we are descendants, uh, American descendants of slavery, then it makes people have to realize the history that was there and not diminish it. You gotta take. You have to take um, responsibility. It need, the responsibility has to be taken. So this is the first time in the almost 52 years of my life I have uh, something that I feel defines me more than any of the other labels that have been brought. And I think when we use this, it reminds people and then we actually have to deal with the, the inequality and the injustices. So I'm really, I'm a big fan of this term. I'm ADOS. <laughs> Question. There was a question. The microphone is coming. <laughs> Hello, hi. Um, I don't have a question, but I just have a comment. Um, I'm also hearing the ADOS for the first time, and I think it's a wonderful, really wonderful term, if we all agree on it, because I'm African, and one thing that really in Africa we view differently is when we see African Americans or black Americans, black people in America, we feel they're very distant from us in a way because of slavery. We don't see ourselves as slaves, we see ourselves as people, as Africans, but we see people in America, the black people, as slaves and their descendants. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say this is such a great, um, you know, way of describing the situation because it's something that is still very, and I think it's more for the younger generations that are not so um, kind of influenced by colonial ed education, like my parents, for example. We really view the slavery as uh, a kind of a threshold in, in kind of the history between Africa and the US, what is the US today? So thank you. Thank you for that. We thank you. Anybody else? Yes, there is a hand in the back. Um, hi, um, my name is Yana. I teach at the Charles University, and I have uh, one very basic question, and one uh, maybe slightly more complicated question. Um, we often debate with my students, like, what would be the proper term when we talk about the black people in the United States in general? So we talked about African Americans, Africans, ADOS. Uh, ADOS. Okay, but that doesn't describe everyone. Uh, it does if you are an um, Afri if you are a Black American descendant of slavery. Okay. If you are from Africa and you live there, like for instance, mm -hmm. Trevor Noah, mm -hmm. Daily Show, that is an African American. Excellent. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I first have to ask about the. The history, I, I guess. My second question is, um, there has been a lot of discussion about the issue of reparations. So um, if any one of you can actually comment where we are um, on this topic. Thank you. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, as I said, I've, I live, I've lived here for 26 years, so I'm the typical black Czech woman. But um, <laughs> uh, no, um, reparations, uh, 
I don't know. I'm assuming it's probably something like when uh, the uh, after '89, when uh, a lot of countries started giving maybe reparations. Here, there were a lot of reparations. Uh, Ilona, you would know your family were also given reparations. They returned their property that was taken. I think the idea behind it is um, people want to be compensated for the slave labor. <laughs> um, the thing, uh, but uh, that's not the, I think that's not the only place that this, these reparations are happening. For instance, there are tons of, we talk, I was talking about the towns, we were talking about the towns, the all black communities burned to the ground or redlining where people were living somewhere and they were the wrong color, but uh, gentrification wanted to come in and change the way things are. So entire communities of black people, uh, and not just blacks, a lot of other minority communities were moved out so that they could bring in maybe a golf course or a highway. Um, and this uh, seems to me a little more feasible because I'm not really sure how we are going to do reparations for everyone who is a descendant of a slave. Um, my last name is Graves and it is an incredibly common name in the Carolinas because they were big old slave masters. Um, and, uh, but uh, again, I am a descendant of slavery. Um, it's too bad they didn't think about this when perhaps my grandparents were alive, when people who, or, or their parents, people who actually had some direct link to it. But I still think, um, I feel like this discussion of reparations, again, is taking away from what we're actually trying to do. And I'm afraid people will get too hung up on who's getting what and who's not. And we're still, not solving the actual problem of the systemic inequality. But uh, Chuck, do you have any thoughts or anyone else? Charles Seaton. I would also like to hear from Dr. Uh, Dr. Finney on this also, for sure. Um, it's, it's, it's so difficult. What, the, the technology isn't there, so first it's who qualifies? Yeah. Do, we all have to, do we all have to do a, a swab DNA, DNA test? You know, it's like, it's, it's recently, uh, outside of Chicago, a uh, city called Evanston, they took a city initiative and did reparations. But it's only tied to real estate. They'll help you, if you're already a, a homeowner, they'll help you with your mortgage or like uh, rehabbing and remodeling your place. And this is what, this is what Evanston has done outside of Chicago. And it's been a limited amount of people, but it's just, just, just like I think of like Obama, you know? Obama, nah. Michelle, Sasha, and uh, the other daughter, yes. You know, it's like, it's, 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 it's impossible. Like, uh, I, it's, it's just such a difficult, we don't have the technology. Because for me, I'm not interested in taking a swab test to somebody's database because their databases are always upping. I could go to this company and they say this and this company and they say that. I'm not interested in yet because the technology isn't there. But yeah, it's just, it's just a wild. Yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Coleman, any thoughts on the reparations? Dr. Coleman, are you with us? What's your take on the reparations? Paging Dr. Coleman. <laughs> it's a long way to the US. It is, and he's in Arizona, or is he in New Mexico? It's a long New way. And he, he did mention he was having some trouble with his, um, with his connection. Okay, well, maybe he'll join us after uh, and give his thoughts on that. Is there anyone else? But it was a very good question, very, very good question. Yes, in the back over there. Uh, I just want to make a comment about the reparations. I'm from America. I'm a black man. So Great. ADOS. <laughs> um, so reparations is another hole that America dug themselves into. Because Abraham Lincoln promised all free slaves 40 acres and a mule. Mm -hmm. And my argument is, is that 
America had kept that promise and given every free slave 40 acres and a mule, we would not be talking about reparations today because those Africans who were slaves, who were freed, they would have taken that mule and that 40 acres and provided for themselves. But America decided not to give them that. So this is why we're even talking about it today. Had they done that, we would be in a whole, I think the community of Africans, blacks in America would be in a completely different place than they are now. That's a very good point. Chuck? And, and then off what Rafiki said, also the homestead act. Because most people have to understand white Americans weren't secure in, in being prosperous in America. The Homestead Act gave property to white Americans around right after slavery. And the clause was if you did any type of agricultural work, you weren't eligible. So that was also, besides the 40 acres and a mule, that was also the slip that the generational wealth that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation also comes from the Homestead Act, where they tell us we haven't created anything or we're doing, not doing anything. They, America always excludes the Homestead Act because this is how a lot of Americans prospered in those times. Thank you. Yes, there's a hand in the middle. CD, hooray. <laughs> Hi, so I had a question for Kelsey. You mentioned earlier that, that you think that the American method of activism, going out into the streets, um, won't bring a lot of the actors in the Czech Republic to the table. I was wondering if you had any ideas on what forms of activism would work, especially in this context. Sure, so that's something that we have been brainstorming ourselves for a while, but I find that there has to be, and, and my own personal theory is that there has to be a balance between behavior that gets attention and then the ability to meaningfully discuss uh, the issue at hand with uh, a party that disagrees. So, for example, if you look at you know the Czech Republic, there are issues of racism right now that are coming up uh, in regards to football. This is the thing that gets the attention. Something has happened and now this issue is in the news, it's in the media, people are discussing it. And that's the first step. But oftentimes, the way that Americans approach um, discussing, or really discussing, but protesting, um, and they're not wrong for doing so, is by openly expressing anger. Uh, anger that I find completely justified. That anger doesn't always translate well into other cultures. Um, in many cultures, anger invalidates a discussion. It's an uncomfortable thing that is best socially avoided. And I actually believe that Czech culture happens to be a culture that values discussion that is unfortunately like calm over, you know, understanding the pain that drives anger at times. Um, and because of that, when you have an issue that comes to light in the media, I believe there has to be an outlet where people can openly discuss and relate to each other as people outside of political orientation. Um, I think that you have to bring your talking points to the table, but also be willing to listen to the fears and concerns, founded or unfounded, um, of those people who stand against whatever sort of progressive ideas you are promoting. And that's easier said than done. It's something that I myself am trying to learn uh, to do as an activist. Um, so I don't see at the moment a lot of spaces within Czech media or, or discourse uh, where these conversations are happening 
so openly and flowing uh, so easily where that ideas can be exchanged and, and challenged as needed. Um, I don't think that there's enough exposure to these ideas uh, outside of the initial shock and anger and what's this, this is, you know, I'm not used to this and the fear that, that generates. It's about taking that fear and founding it, sort of burying it really uh, under the ideas um, that, I'm losing the thought here, but it's about kind of getting rid of that fear by exposing people to the ideas that are really behind uh, the motivations of activism. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, we'll check the social me media meanwhile. I think this is the last question. Yeah, okay. sure. Sure. The thing also with, with the Czech Republic is, as I like to tell people, it's a klutzy world. <laughs> the, the community here is, is so strong. I remember up, telling when um, I live in a small village, and the, the main reason I moved here was because I moved here for Czech suburban socialist life. I came here, moved to my wife's village to raise my daughter, and I moved here because the family and friends all took me in. And just so much love that I have a big family in America. And I had never experienced this much love. And that's why I'm here. But with the friend, I have a, a group of Klutzi, Patnas, 15 Czech guys. They, they're the ones who got me jobs. If I wanted to play basketball, they found me people to play basketball with. And I told them that around when my daughter gets 10, I wanted to move back to America, just to throw her in the cesspool, just for a little while. No, no, because if she moves, she'll be terrified. She's, a, she's dual. She needs and America's, so my children. America's her home. She needs to be taught about it, because if she lives this good, pure life out here and goes to America the first time, a couple bad instances, and she might not ever want to come back. And I think that'd be a waste. But the relationships here are so strong and they start from, from very early ages. The Klutzi are so strong and the Hoki are so strong together. You have to penetrate their groups. It's not that you can just come into them and talk to them. You have to enter their circles. You have to go to the pub, drink with them, talk with them, have a, have a smoked turkey roast at their house, actually communicate. And this is Czech culture you know, pub life, you know, interaction. And this is how you have the conversation. And that's like I was saying, going back to that, that jersey I wear, it forces a conversation on them where they see me and be like, Tevila, we, I got to talk to him and see why he's wearing that. And that's, that's the opportunity. I have to draw check people, you have to draw check people to you. You're not going to be able, they're not, you're not going to be able to attack check people outside of their group. You're going to have to infiltrate them and become friends and family with them. And then you'll have their ear. But if you're on the outside, you're just complaining at their culture. They see you nitpicking at them. And they won't accept that. It'll just be rhetoric, propaganda. But the best way I've observed and the education I've had from dealing with Czech people is you have to enter their circle. You have to have a conversation. It's fall. You got to sit down and have some board chuck with them, you know. And this is the way that you'll actually have real conversations with Chesky people. Yeah, I'd have to say, uh, I suppose everyone's experience is different. Um, but I have had a very good experience. Uh, very few bad experiences in, in the 26 years that I've lived here. And I've lived here longer than I've lived in America. Uh, Czech people can seem closed, but they're not. I think that they're really actually a warm uh, group of people. That has been my experience. Um, and I think um, when we talk about what's going on in the States and why so many Czech people are surprised because uh, they figure how could there be uh, racism, systemic inequality and things like that when we've had a black president there. 
but uh, again, just a band-aid on a gaping wound and no one actually looking at the cause of the wound. But um, I'd have to say that's going to have to be for another discussion on another day. Um, Tomash, is there something else you'd like to add? No, on the contrary, I was just heading the same direction. <laughs> okay. I was uh, hoping uh, to thank everybody yes. for joining us. So at first, thank you, the your auditory, for joining this uh, debate. We actually hope that this is what we um, uh, hope will be many up close events, up close is the name of the project, under the Behafir uh, Institute, and we hope you stay tuned and join us next time again. Secondly, yes. this is the right moment to thank our panel. Am I right, Tanjko? I'd have to say, so uh, a big thanks to Kelsey Roman, um, our uh, new generation uh, of activism, I would also like to thank Dr. Norman Hervey, who is uh, from the forefront of uh, activism in America. I'd like to thank Charles Chuck Seaton, the hip hop master from the Eastern Prague. Chuck Diesel, the hip hop, say it again. Correspondent. Correspondent. Oh, wow. you need to teach me some hip hop after this. <laughs> I'm so stubborn with it. Thank you so much for your presence. <laughs> Last but not least, if he's still, if he's still there with, with us, us. we'd really like to thank most of all Dr. Finney Coleman for joining us uh, via Zoom today yes, for today's there conversation. He is. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hopefully maybe meeting you one day. Maybe one day in person, we'll actually be able to get you over here once we defeat this whole COVID blah, blah, blah. But uh, we're looking forward to actually having you here with us in person. But we thank you so much for joining us today via Zoom. Dr. Finney Coleman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, I, and, I, and I wish you all the best of luck um, in your efforts to continue um, making voices heard that don't often get heard. And I do look forward to meeting you all in the spring. Hopefully we'll uh, have a chance to travel there and, and uh, have more conversations like this very rich conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, thanks to our online stream audience, for the people who have been watching us through the streaming, we thank you very much for being with us as well. On social networks and the internet, thank you so much, dear internet, for allowing us um, to sustain the connection. Yes. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my fellow colleague, Tonya Graves, the ADOS moderator <laughs> at this panel. <laughs> thank you. And of course, Tomasz Boschka. Have a good evening, see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>